Good morning. I want to welcome you to Grand Rounds. Um, I'm Devesh Agarwal. I'm the uh, director of the Pediatric Residency Program and also vice chair for medical education here at Children's National Medical Center. Or, actually, I should say Children's National Hospital, um, <laughs> our new name. Um, on behalf of the Pediatric Residency Program, uh, it's my distinct honor to introduce uh, the speaker uh, for the Phyllis and Gabe Lander Memorial uh, uh, lecture, the Grand Rounds Lectures today. But before I introduce our accomplished speaker, I wanted to first uh, introduce the Luander Lectureship, which started uh, 37 years ago. I'm delighted to have in our audience uh, Dr. Bill Luander and his wife, uh, Tracy. Uh, Dr. Uh, Bill Luander was a pediatric resident here uh, and chief resident here. Uh, sadly, during his residency, his mom, Phyllis, passed away unexpectedly. In her honor, in her memory, Dr. Bill Luander's father, Gabe, uh, helped establish uh, the Memorial Fund, which endowed this annual Grand Rounds Lectureship. Now, this Grand Rounds Lectureship has, has featured uh, very renowned pediatricians. Uh, I think you have a full list in your pamphlets, but people like Angelo DeGeorge, yes, of the syndrome, um, DeGeorge, uh, Frank Oski, T. Perry Brazelton, Stephen Ludwig, uh, George McCracken, Sarah Long, Lewis First, Virginia Moyer, Basil Zatelli, just to name a few. To those names, will be added the name of our accomplished speaker, uh, Dr. Shantanu Agarwal. Um, Dr. Shantanu Agarwal is president and CEO of the National Quality Forum. But before joining NQF, Dr. Agarwal was the former deputy administrator uh, for CMS, a, a Center for Medicare and Medicaid Services. Uh, let me explain to you what is the deputy administrator. He was number two in charge of what many people would call the largest medical insurance company in the world, CMS, Medicare and Medicaid. He reported directly then to the number one in charge, who was uh, then the Secretary of Health, uh, Sylvia Burwell. That's quite an accomplishment. While at CMS, uh, uh, Dr. Uh, Agarwal also uh, was a former director of one of its largest centers, CPI, the Center for uh, Professional Integrity, Center for Program Integrity. Uh, at CMS, uh, Dr. Agarwal led an effort uh, to improve the physician experience with Medicare uh, by working to minimize the administrative tasks. With, with which doctors contend. He was also one of the main architects of CMS's strategy and action plan to address the national opioid misuse epidemic. His main focus while at CPI, the Center for uh, Program Integrity, was improving healthcare value by lowering the cost of care through the detection and prevention of waste, fraud, and abuse. From 2012 to 2014, under his leadership, CPI's prevention efforts saved Medicare and Medicaid $50 billion. That's huge. Dr. Agarwal completed his undergraduate uh, education at Brown University, his medical student education uh, at uh, Cornell, uh, his training in emergency medicine uh, at uh, the Children's Hospital, uh, sorry, not Children's Hospital, but the Hospital of the University of Pennsylvania. Um, he has a master's degree in social and political science from Cambridge University in England. Um, he has testified numerous times before Congress uh, and is a frequent national speaker on healthcare and cost. He's also a well-published author uh, with dozens of, of articles uh, and publications in such high-impact journals as the Journal of, Medical, Journal of the American Medical Association, New England Journal of Medicine, Academic Medicine, uh, British Medical Journal, Annals of Emergency Medicine. And in, most interestingly, Dr. Shantanu Agarwal has deep ties to the Children's National Medical Center. Now, some of you in the audience may be wondering, if you look at his name and you look at my last name, if we're related. Um, we look a little bit alike, too, um, but uh, for the record, and I understand this is being recorded, we are not related. Uh, that might be an impeachable offense. Um, but Dr. Agarwal is actually married. Um, his ties to Children's National are because he is married to one of our terrific hospitals here, Dr. Kavita Parek. Um, so without further ado, I would like to call Dr. Shantanu Agarwal. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Shantanu Agarwal to Children's National Grand Rounds and to the uh, Luander Memorial Grand Rounds Lectureship. Can you hear me? Excellent. Uh, thank you, Devish. So um, I really want to start by thanking uh, Dr. Luander for the opportunity uh, to uh, come and present at this lecture. It's a true honor. It was great getting to uh, meet you both last night. Uh, and I hope uh, that both the topic and the sort of conduct of the lecture do honor to your family. Uh, so thank you again for that. Uh, Devish, uh, really appreciate the invitation. Devish is absolutely right. So same last name. We grew up in Toledo, Ohio together. Uh, people often thought that Devish was my older brother, uh, my much older brother. Uh, 
But Devesh was actually a rock star in the Indian community. My parents would often say, you know, uh, they would compare me to, to Devesh, and they'd say, you know, Devesh did this and Devesh did that. Uh, very popular. So uh, when Devesh invited me to come give this talk, of course, I was really excited to do it. And 30 seconds after accepting, I got a phone call from my dad who said, hey, you just accepted a talk from Devesh? Uh, I was like, how did the Indian community in Toledo figure that out so fast? Very fascinating. Uh, and then, yes, I did want to disclose. I'm glad you did it. So I don't have financial disclosures, but I do have personal ties to uh, Children's National through Kavita Parikh, my wife. She does not often admit she's my wife, but there she is uh, in the front row, unavoidable. I will tell you that um, she was really thoughtful and careful as I was preparing for this talk. She tried to do her best to uh, ensure a lot of quality assurance for the talk. Um, as I was preparing for it, she made it very clear that this was an important event and that I couldn't screw this up. <laughs> and I got one of these at home. <laughs> so I am definitely doing my best today. Uh, so what I wanted to do um, over the next 40 minutes or so is uh, really a, a talk in three parts. I want to tell you more about the National Quality Forum and our role in quality measurement on a national level. Uh, second, I uh, will do a deep dive on pediatric measurement, sort of what's the state of the art, what do I see as the issues and challenges and how we'll deal with some of those challenges. And third, um, I want to discuss in a pretty good amount of detail health equity, which is a major priority of ours. And I think uh, the next uh, phase that uh, quality really has to tackle is um, you know, really addressing healthcare disparities uh, and the social determinants of health. So that is what we're going to cover. So let's launch into it. So first, the National Quality Forum. Uh, we're a nonprofit. We're based right here in DC. We're now 20 years old, so we were launched in 1999. Uh, and uh, we really pride ourselves, our core mission is around bringing scientific rigor and consistency to quality measurement and improvement. Uh, we're a membership organization, so importantly, we have 400 organizations that are members of NQS. Uh, and one of the central hallmarks of the organization is that our members and the organizations that get involved in our work are all very multi-stakeholder. So they're extremely diverse by design. Our largest segment of membership are, is uh, hospitals and health systems. Um, next comes uh, specialty societies. Uh, and then behind that are payers, consumer, and uh, patient advocates, uh, purchasers of healthcare, employers like SAMHSA. So the purpose of all of that diversity is to make sure that when we look at quality measurement or improvement strategies, again, we're not just following the evidence. We develop a consensus among all of these stakeholders that the solutions we're putting forward work for healthcare and that they're good solutions. So that's really critical for us. And um, about 80% of the members that are currently members have been with us for over a decade. So they really are invested in our mission, which we obviously appreciate. And then another big aspect of our mission is focusing on health equity. So again, I will cover that. But we uh, have sort of 10 plus years in the health equity space to make sure we are addressing the root causes of quality problems in American healthcare. So um, I won't touch on this in great detail except to tell you that, you know, we really uh, recently reassessed our mission um, to ask if, if it is uh, sufficiently broad. Uh, and our, our previous mission statement really focused on healthcare and measurement. What we decided as an organization is that we needed to focus on health and we needed to look at solutions that were certainly inclusive of measurement but went beyond that as well. And so we are trying to bring our same, same scientific and consensus-based approach uh, to other topics now as well. So maybe for the students in the audience and the residents and trainees, uh, the fellows, um, I want to take you back 20 years um, about where we were when NQF first got started. So in the 1990s, there was a lot of appropriate concern around the quality and safety of care that, is, that was being provided in uh, the American delivery system, particularly in institutional settings like hospitals. So uh, a tremendous amount of research had come out at the time. Um, that characterized safety events that were occurring uh, in American healthcare. And then sort of the seminal work was the 1999 Institute of Medicine report called To Air is Human. IOM is now known as NAM, and they've obviously continued that thread of work. So what this report found is uh, here, this is a couple of quotes from the report. Um, they found nearly 98,000 deaths occurring in American hospitals as a result of patient safety events and medical errors. And they actually said, if you, if you compared American healthcare to other industries, other high-risk industries, we simply do not have the same attention to safety and a safety culture as other industries have. Think aviation, automotive, nuclear power, et cetera. 
Um, what's actually uh, very interesting is that uh, there is a BMJ article from just a couple of years ago um, looking uh, with better data at the same methodology. So they undertook essentially the same analysis that the IOM had undertaken and found that the IOM report might have vastly understated deaths due to medical errors. And so they pegged it at higher than 250,000 medical deaths per year as a result of error, particularly, again, in hospital settings. Um, if, you, if that number is accurate and you look at CDC data, that would put death from medical error as the sixth leading cause of death in the United States. Um, so uh, behind uh, things like uh, you know, chronic uh, medical conditions and trauma. So that, that number is um, focusing, it focuses, it focuses the attention, and that's become our central mission since our founding. Um, so when all of this data was coming out, the Clinton administration launched a special commission um, that was uh, that looked at it was the president's advisory committee on consumer protection and quality in healthcare. Um, so the whole goal of this commission was to put forward recommendations for how to change this dynamic, how to bring a culture of safety to healthcare. One of the recommendations was actually to create a private entity that would bring rigor to measurements and improvement, and that private entity became the NQS. Now, w one thing I'll just add on this is um, the. The sort of the President's Commission report is hallmark for us. I mean, it's still very much ingrained in our culture at NQS. Two out of the four CEOs we've had were somehow connected to the Commission. One sat on the Commission, and one actually staffed the Commission as a staff member of the IOM. And so since our founding, um, this has been, a, you know, sort of looking at that Commission and taking it very seriously has been really critical for us. So I won't go into much detail on this slide. I think this is a whole talk onto itself to really understand how measurement has evolved since that report. Um, I characterize it as uh, occurring along a few phases. So first, um, we have really spent a lot of time trying to define the problem. That's what the IOM report really did, is it defined the problem and it brought public attention uh, to the problem. And since then, we've done, of course, you all and many others uh, lead research that helps bring further definition to quality and safety issues. Second, we've really put a paradigm around measurement. So again, uh, at the time of the report, measurement was certainly occurring, but there wasn't uh, the same belief that there could be a national approach to measurement, that we could address national priorities. Uh, and, uh, you know, there was, I think some basic questions around whether uh, measures really could capture healthcare. And I think something that you heard commonly at the time was there's no way a measure can, can capture my practice, my patient. And I think we have demonstrated significant evolution on that front, and I think we are certainly able to do that today. The next big phase in the quality movement has been public transparency. So things like hospital compare, um, employer-based transparency, private sector-based transparency, trying to get quality data available to the public online, et cetera. Uh, and then the latest phase, you know, particularly I think typified in the last 10 years or so, has been paying for value. So initially that started as pay for reporting, so give us your quality data and we will alter your reimbursement for that. And then more recently has really uh, transitioned to paying for actual outcomes and trying to get more delivery models into alternative payment approaches. So that is, I think, where we are today. There's a lot of work to be done in terms of APMs and, again, continuing that transition to value. I would probably in another year or two add another phase to this slide which is really addressing the social determinants of health. So I think we are starting to have conversations now asking how do we get healthcare dollars to effectuate change in the community? And we are seeing, and I'll talk about it more, the impact of social determinants of healthcare disparity on clinical outcomes. That is sort of an unavoidable science now. And so we do have to ask the question of how we move healthcare dollars, a huge $2 trillion economy, to affect change in the community. So I expect this slide will be updated in the near term to say, you know, let's go after social risk as well. All right, so these are our strategic priorities. It's a little bit of background of where we have been as a community and not just NQS. Our priorities are to continue to evolve measurements so that we are facilitating the transition of value, um, to focus on national priorities, and I'll touch on them, a few of them today. And then finally, of course, uh, health equity. And health equity is actually woven into all of our work. We ask every project we launch, every, you know, program that we are implementing, how will this affect equity? How do we bring an equity lens to that work? So now's the portion to talk about measurement uh, and specifically uh, pediatric measurement. Um, so we do a few things um, in our role as a national convener on quality measurement and improvement. Um, 
specifically for the public sector. So important for you to know is that Congress actually funds a piece of NQF, so they pass in statute a funding authorization that then comes to NQF in order to drive three uh, significant areas of work really at the behest of the public sector. So you as taxpayers are invested in us. We take that really seriously. That funding has been coming to us for over a decade now. So I'm going to touch on the three programs that you all are paying for. So first is measure endorsement. Um, endorsement, you can think of as basically a certification process for measurement. Anyone can bring a measure to us. We have various clinical committees that I will show you a list of in a second. We create standards for endorsing these measures, and then our committees will review measures, uh, utilize those standards, and make a recommendation about whether to endorse the measure or not. These measures cover a wide array of topics. I'm going to focus on pediatrics today, but uh, I could put together a similar set of slides on adult medicine, on acute inpatient, post-acute care, home health, et cetera. They really are, are trying to cover the entirety of the, the entire continuum of care. We have about 600 measures that are endorsed today. Measures are required to come back to us at least every three years in order to retain their endorsement. And the pie chart really breaks out of the endorsed measure portfolio today what do they look like, right? So in the basic kind of Donovidian framework of measurement, I, you know, this is broken out by structural measures, process measures, outcome measures, uh, patient-reported outcomes. Uh, and I'll give you, again, that information at the, PR, at the uh, pediatric level. But the big takeaway from this is that after 20 years of endorsement, we basically launched endorsement in year one, uh, and we've iterated on the standards since then. After 20 years, we are still stuck in this middle ground where we have about half of our measures being process measures, and half being outcome. We are definitely you know, pushing headlong into trying to get more outcome measures. They are extremely challenging to develop if you've ever tried to develop a measure. Um, but this is the status today. Our endorsement process does allow for structural measures to be endorsed, but it's usually pretty challenging. That's why you see a very small wedge for structural measures. And the other thing that I would, you know, so there's two wedges that are called out here that I'd like to see increase. First, we need more cost and resource utilization measures, particularly around the appropriate care and the total cost of care. Those are lagging. Um, we have active work going on there. And then we need patient-reported outcome measures as well, um, which are highly lagging. Um, and I'll, I'll just give you one example uh, that exists in pediatrics, unfortunately, only one example. So that's the state of the art in endorsement currently. These are the committees that conduct endorsement. So as you can see, they're um, organized around various clinical topics and also some cost-cutting topics. We do have a pediatrics committee. Um, so all of these committees, I just want to take some, a moment to tell you, they're all multi-stakeholder, right? So they have maybe 25, 30 individuals uh, on these committees, but they are selected to represent the entire ecosystem. So there are, again, doctors and nurses sitting next to payers, patients, subject matter experts, et cetera. And again, that diversity is sort of core to NQF. That's in our DNA. We do not launch a committee without having it being, being multi-stakeholder because we are not aligned with any particular part of healthcare. Our goal is to stand in between. We're a disinterested third party to make sure that all of us are following the science and best practice. So why endorsement matters? <laughs> so a measure comes into endorsement. It takes seven months to complete the process. Um, that is not trivial. I know that's hard for measure developers to actually undertake that kind of process. It is a rigorous review that involves not just committee input, but also public input. So we release you know, committee deliberations and recommendations to the public, and anyone in the public can comment on what's occurring. Um, why it matters is because endorsed measures are frequently utilized by health systems for quality improvement efforts, by payers, both public and private, for pay for performance efforts, right? So these are high impact measures. They can get picked up for national level implementation in programs like Medicare and Medicaid. And so we do have to ensure that there's a lot of scientific rigor behind them. Um, I have often heard, you know, as, as I go out to health systems, um, they will tell me that as, uh, if they have a particular quality improvement program in mind, um, their first go-to place will be the NQF endorsed portfolio because their own clinicians and physicians will accept those measures as being highly vetted. So that's why endorsement matters, and that's why we try, try to maintain a really high and stringent standard around endorsement. So the second program that I wanted to make sure you knew about um, is what's called the Measures Application Partnership. So this is a program specifically done at the behest of CMS, where CMS will send measures to NQF. We will again convene multi-stakeholder committees, and we'll make recommendations to CMS about measures that should be implemented 
in Medicare uh, and Medicaid programs. So this is um, a really fascinating program because it's done out of the traditional government rulemaking cycle, um, which is very interesting. It allows for more efficient deliberation of these measures, and specifically this is called out in statute because otherwise CMS would not have the authority to uh, conduct this kind of program. So what happens is on an annual cycle, CMS creates a list of measures that they are considering for their programs. This list is called the Measures Under Consideration List, also known as the MUC List. So this is the worst name you can give to a measurement enterprise list. Uh, we literally are damaging ourselves by calling it the MUC list, but we do. Um, and having been at CMS, I'll tell you, we are really bad at naming things. Um, so we consistently do that. Um, so the MUC list considers sometimes hundreds of measures, and then we create, um, we, we leverage these committees. So there's committees focused on just clinician measurement. So you can think about individual physicians or group practices hospital measurement, and then post-acute care, long-term care measurement. That's on the Medicare side. And then on the Medicaid side, we've worked over the years to establish adult, adult and child core measure sets that can be implemented by states, as well as a dual eligible uh, core measure set. So that's done an annual cycle. This is a really busy slide. You're not supposed to read the individual measures, but if I were to just take the child core measure set that we've established, and now it's been iterated on about six times, these are the measures that are in that uh, child core measure set as of um, sort of fiscal 2017. And this is how many states in the bar chart have implemented that measure. In other words, they, the state requires reporting along that measure. So what you'll see is that there's a fair amount of variability, right? So this is a core measure set, but Medicaid actually does not have the authority, CMS Medicaid does not have the authority to require states to report on certain measures. So it's actually voluntary reporting. So they put these measures up, they make them available, they make technical assistance available in order to implement the measures, uh, and then it's up to the states to actually do the implementation and data collection. So on average, um, each measure, again, on average, is implemented by about 30 states. Um, that affects things like the comparability of measurement, right? So if you are a Medicaid beneficiary and you want to look at how different Medicaid programs handle uh, or, you know, uh, uh, arrive at certain clinical outcomes, you will have a hard time getting a national picture across Medicaid. That's a, a sort of an unfortunate reality of the program. These numbers have improved over time. We expect them to continue improving. And I will tell you that the current administration is actually talking about getting the authority to make this mandatory, which I think would be important, in, again, in order to get that national picture of how Medicaid programs and patients are actually faring. The, the last uh, bit of work that I want to tell you about, again, publicly funded, is um, what we call essentially blueprint projects. So sometimes there are areas of measurement where the, the project is less focused on specific measures, but really on evolving measurement in that area. So areas that don't have good measures today or areas that may have good measures, but really it's time to take it to the next level, we'll often uh, we'll, we'll do a separate convening on just those topic areas in order to put forward ideas to the community about what can be improved in measurement. So these are examples that we've conducted, example projects and topics that we've handled over the last few years. I'll just give you a couple of examples so you understand what this looks like. So telehealth is a report that we put out now about 18 months ago. You can find all these reports on our website. Telehealth extremely important, growing as an area of utilization and appropriately so, really seen as a solution to access issues across the country. But there's not a single endorsed measure in telehealth. There's no way to assess how a telehealth encounter is similar to or different from an in-person clinical encounter. So when there's no measures, we try to put together a framework for measurement. We say, we sort of convene telehealth providers, patients, and others, and ask, well, what does measurement in this space look like? What outcomes should we be evaluating? So we put that forward as a set of measurement concepts um, and a framework for measurement, and then frequently developers will pick up on that framework, and we'll start to see uh, measures come through endorsement. And then they'll be utilized by you know, programs like, like private payers or Medicare as they are investing more in telehealth services. Another example, just to show you what these can look like, so trauma outcomes, we, we are conducting in the middle of a trauma project right now. There are great measures of trauma. Trauma is probably, uh, as far as various topical areas, further along than other uh, parts of healthcare. But I think we should still be asking, what can we do to evolve and improve trauma measurement? So we're doing that project now. And one that I find very interesting is an ER doc. So we, are, uh, we have a, a chief complaint project going on right now. So the question really fundamentally is, does the chief complaint presenting to the ER 
match at all to other outcomes? And can we use that chief complaint to um, track to other measures uh, later on, either uh, you know, after discharge to home or if there's an admission, then after admission. So this is really early. Um, I don't know the answer to this yet. There's going to have to be a lot of analysis to figure out how the chief complaint uh, correlates or does not. But I think it's kind of exciting to engage in this kind of work. So all right, pediatric measures now. Several slides on just where we are in pediatrics. Um, so if you look at our entire endorsed portfolio, so these are measures that come through our pediatrics committee or measures that come from other committees that have a pediatric focus. We have about 99 endorsed measures. The vast majority of them consider, so 83, focus on the pediatric population as their main audience, sort of the main uh, population of concern. And then the balance consider children uh, and adolescents in the continuity of care. So it might be a measure that includes adults as well, um, but uh, the pediatric population is part of the measure. If you break out, again, you know, according to that Donabidian framework, um, we have the vast majority of our measures are process measures, um, you know, a little bit worse as a, as a proportion than other areas of measurement. Um, we have 36 outcome measures, seven structural measures, and then unfortunately just one uh, patient-reported outcome measure, which is really the pediatrics CAP survey. So it's a, it's a CAP survey of patient experience that frequently goes to, uh, you know, parents and caregivers, guardians of the patient. So that's where we are today. I'm going to give you a little bit more detail. So these are the topical areas that the measures cover. So as you can see, there's a wide array of topics that these measures do cover, anything from behavioral health to admissions and readmissions, cardiac care, et cetera. The biggest um, wedges are, um, are actually, so primary care and chronic illness and prevention and population health, which is, I think, what you would expect in terms of just, you know, individual measure volume, right? And then you can see a whole array of other measures. And again, you know, a neurology measure might actually come through our neurology committee, um, but we are very careful to, you know, make sure that it's labeled appropriately as, as pediatrics um, focused or uh, involving a pediatric population. So one more cut of the data, um, because things get kind of interesting when you go one level deeper. Um, if you look at the entire portfolio, you find that about two-thirds of the measures are actually focused on uh, complex care uh, situations or special healthcare care needs situations, right? So even though some of the topics look very cross-cutting, um, we actually, there's a, there's a pretty strong focus on complex care, right? So uh, these are just some examples that I would highlight for you. So uh, sepsis, meningitis, and very lo uh, low birth weight neonates, um, uh, you know, looking at pediatric hemodialysis, um, pediatric heart surgery mortality rates. So these are things that are clearly important, that are clearly very specialized, that will impact an organization like Children's National, um, but they're not very general in terms of pediatric care overall. If you were to look at um, uh, primary and preventive care, we have just about a third of the endorsed uh, measures cover that population, and again, these are just some examples of what those measures look like. So uh, measures around URI, dental services, et cetera. What's striking about this list, if you just look at these individual measures, is that quite a number of them are process measures and not great process measures, to be honest with you, things that we'd like to move on from. So oral health, dental health is critically important for children. Um, lots of healthcare utilization in that space, um, Medicaid coverage, uh, and yet, our dental measures really are all about utilization of services. So how many services did you get? Did you get a type of service or not? If you look at well-child visits, we are tracking at a measurement level merely the number of visits. Um, we are not really able to assess the quality of the visit, what's occurring in the visit, or any outcomes associated with that visit. So the process issues that I pointed out, right, the majority of these measures being process measures, really dominates this list, which I think is highly limiting for preventative and primary care in pediatrics. There are, um, you know, good immunization measures around uh, immunization status and the prevalence of immunization that I think are really important, and a lot of those measures are picked up by Medicaid programs for voluntary reporting. So this uh, tension between complex and primary care is actually something that's really striking in the pediatrics portfolio and not quite as dominant in other portfolios of measurement uh, on the adult side. So, you know, one thing that our pediatrics committee has often uh, remarked about uh, on 
is the uh, inability for us to measure the well child visit. Again, lots of pediatrics healthcare interactions are, you know, well child care or, you know, sort of sick care and otherwise well child. Um, it's primary care interactions. That looks, I know, very different from your lens and perspective, um, but nationally speaking, that's where the volume of care is occurring, and that is exactly what we are not able to measure. Um, so that's troubling, right? That, that gives you a sense of where we have to evolve measurement so that we are actually picking up what matters to the vast majority of the population the majority of the time. Um, I think the complex care measures that we have can certainly be evolved, and there are great leaders that are working on that, um, you know, and, and we will continue to help, try to help evolve it, but I think the need is clearly on the other side. And I will, so this dynamic plays out quite a bit, and I think you'll understand why in a few slides. I'm going to give you some of the drivers for why this dynamic uh, should persist. So before we get there, right, we have almost 100 pediatrics measures. It's about a sixth of our overall portfolio. And if you ask the pediatrics committee, so annually we ask every committee to assess what the big measurement gaps are. Um, what are the topical areas that are not covered? Where do we need to see more measures being developed. And we are in this funny place in healthcare quality after 20 years of concerted effort where we clearly have too many measures in some spaces. We have measure duplication, overlapping measures, and in other spaces we have practically nothing. So this is the entire list of topical areas sort of most updated from our pediatrics committee on where there are measurement gaps. I'm gonna just draw out a few themes for you that you could hopefully take away from today because it's otherwise a quite big list. So first theme, I sort of touched, in, uh, touched on it already. Routine child care, oral health are simply not covered very well. When they are covered, they tend to be process measures. That has to improve. It affects a huge percentage of the population. Um, there are also areas of complex care, specialty care, that are, that are also not covered very well. So we do not have a single measure uh, for leukemia. We don't have any hematologic uh, oncology measures at all. I think we've got a very small number of oncology measures generally in pediatrics. Um, so uh, all of these things, uh, you know, are areas where we do need uh, more measures even on the complex care side. Um, there are then, uh, you know, diseases. Uh, there's sort of prevalence of social issues that are quite high in the pediatric population that might not affect every child, every adolescent. Um, but we should be covering in measurements, so things like sickle cell anemia, um, dosing and diagnostic errors, mental health. There are measures along these lines, but probably an insufficient amount. We currently have just two measures for sickle cell anemia. I view that as a major health equity issue as well, given the population that it affects. Um, that could be also said about injuries and trauma, uh, perhaps even mental health. So these are areas that are, again, are relatively high prevalence, and uh, there's insufficient measurement, particularly outcome measurement. And finally, um, there are areas that are uh, kind of missing in the overall portfolio, even outside of pediatrics. So these are highlighted here. We don't have really good measures of care coordination. That's lacking basically everywhere. We have a care coordination committee that focuses on those measures, but most of the measures that come to that committee are very process-based. And if they see one more measure that calls out uh, a fax machine, they're going to get really upset at me. Um, so we do actually have measures where the, to meet the measure, it's a process measure to, to say that you've, you've coordinated care, you have to fax your medical record to somebody else. That's, that is like ridiculous. Um, so we never want to do that again. We have actually called out those measure developers and said, do not send them. Um, I had to explain, I have a 12 year old daughter. She asked me recently what a fax machine is. I had to explain to her, given everything that I know, that it is a highly advanced piece of healthcare technology. Because uh, we are the only industry left utilizing it. Um, so that, that's a hugely um, underrepresented area in measurement. Patient reported outcomes and patient experience measures, that becomes really interesting in the pediatric population, but I think uh, we definitely need it uh, in peds and beyond. Um, access measures, remarkably, we have very few access measures. So access to primary care, specialty care. We're actually launching, uh, hoping to launch, uh, knock on wood, a project with the Veterans Administration uh, in the coming few weeks, um, really trying to help them design an approach to access, given all the issues and concerns that they've had around access. And what's fascinating with their challenges is that they are going to have, sol have to solve for access in their integrated delivery network, but also because of recent legislation, they're going to have to solve for access um, out in the private sector. Um, so that'll be, I hope, a really interesting project. So you can see the these other areas, and obviously social determinants of health, very early in the measurement enterprise, and I think there's a lot of work to be done there. 
All right, so why does this, why is the picture the way that it is? So I wanted to lay out for you a few challenges in pediatric measurement so you understand some of the drivers. So challenge number one is funding. Um, the biggest funder of measurement in the country is basically the Medicare program. So if you just look for funding level, you can find this report, which uh, cites that over several appropriations, CMS, and specifically its Medicare arm, has been given almost $250 million to spend on quality measure development alone, right? That is outside of other quality improvement efforts. So Medicare also has access to hospital engagement networks, quality improvement organizations, patient and family engagement networks. Those are all separately funded. If you were to include all of the quality funding that Medicare has access to, you would easily be in excess of a billion dollars, right? And that is reflected in the entire measurement enterprise across the country. If you look at Medicaid in comparison, so Medicaid is extremely vital for pediatric care, right? 35 million kids are covered by Medicaid. They cover, uh, that program covers about half of all deliveries. I cannot, and even after concerted effort on the part of me and several people on my team, I cannot find a number for how much Medicaid spends on its quality measurement enterprise. But what I can tell you from working with Medicaid is that they do very little de novo measure development. They just don't have the funding resources to do it. Um, most of the Medicaid work that we do um, really is the result of environmental scans. So we try to identify good measures from other programs, maybe even private payers, that are rigorous, that can get through the endorsement process, and then we will recommend those measures to Medicaid. But Medicaid itself is able to do little de novo measure development entirely out of a funding question, right? So that does have downstream effect on the entire enterprise. So when it comes to complex versus um, primary care, Medicaid has a lot of interest in primary care, but because they're not able to put those measures forward, we see the imbalance that we see. Uh, we also see the imbalance in the level of reporting since they don't have the authority to require reporting. I think this is a tremendous shortfall in the American approach to quality improvement, um, particularly when it comes to pediatrics. So if you walk into uh, the Health and Human Services building down on Independence Avenue, there is a quote that, that is enshrined in a plaque glued to the wall. Right, you, you know, this, this matters a lot. It, um, it has been there since the, this uh, building was erected. It's this quote from Hubert Humphrey, which really talks about uh, making sure that we as a society are taking care of the elderly, of the sick, and of our children. And it, I would argue, and I would argue it all day long, and CMS knows it, we are not doing right by our kids because we do not fund quality for them the way we fund it for the elderly in the Medicare program. So the second challenge um, in, in uh, pediatric measurement is the lack of good data. So there's two flavors of this challenge. First, most measures are developed off of claims data, registry data, and to some degree, EHR data, but that's definitely up and coming. Most registries and most claims data that are available really focus on either the Medicare population or the private pay population. It's actually quite hard to pool Medicaid claims data. So right now, if you were to go online, you could easily download, and just go to CMS, you could easily download a 5% extract of Medicare claims data. That's available to you. It's for free. Anyone can get it. And that data, the, the moment it became available, really started uh, driving the healthcare conversation. So every company that, that comes to you that wants to sell you analytics for healthcare is utilizing Medicare data as its backbone. They can either get the free 5% or they can pay a nominal fee and get 100% of Medicare claims data for any given year going back several years. That is simply not available on the Medicaid side. In order to get Medicaid data, and you know if you do research, you've got to go to individual Medicaid agencies in order to try to get them to partner with each other and give you the data. You can go to a data vendor and try to buy it, but it's much more expensive than trying to buy it from the government. That inherently limits the amount of testing and measure development that occurs on the front end that affects the pediatric population, um, simply getting access to the data. The second flavor of data as a problem is in the evidence. So we take evidence very seriously. Step number one in endorsement is asking what is the evidence behind this measure? How do you know that this measure, if endorsed, will actually help to drive quality improvement in healthcare? As you know, there's a lot of evidence in the adult population, particularly around randomized control trials, it gets much more paltry on the pediatric side for, I think, a variety of good reasons and then not so good reasons. So developers have tried to work their way around the data problems. They, fundamentally, the first data problem around lack of access to sufficient claims data or other data is very hard to work around. Either you've got to amass the data or you've got to pay for the data. 
Around the evidence issue, we've been challenged by some developers and indeed even by our own committee to think more broadly and to try to innovate. So we have had developers come to us with pediatric focused measures where their evidence is from the adult literature and adult randomized control trials. So this is an example of one such measure. It's uh, adverse events uh, in the uh, pediatric inpatient population. Um, there was an insufficient amount of evidence in the literature to support endorsing this measure. The measure developer made a strong argument that we could refer to the adult literature, that it would suffice, and that you know, logically it should be similar on the pediatric side. And so because of the importance of the measure, its importance potentially for quality improvement, we in our committee uh, agreed with that argument and we went ahead and endorsed this measure and we'll be assessing um, how well the, the you know, performance is noted when we reassess the measure for continued uh, maintenance of endorsement. But I will tell you, as, as I think we are willing to, as much as we are willing to sort of push uh, beyond our boundaries and try to do what's right for quality improvement, this is an inherently limited strategy. Because even while the committee was arguing that we ought to endorse the measure, they were also arguing, but by the way, if, if randomized trials were done, we might find that drivers of adverse events in the pediatric population differ significantly from adults. And that the weighting of, of uh, potential adverse events might be different from adults. So for example, drug overdoses or drug um, uh, misdoses are really big deals in the pediatric populations given potentially narrow, narrow therapeutic ranges. But we don't know without the literature and without the research what to emphasize in this measure or to de-emphasize that would make it honed to the pediatric population. So it is a limited strategy, but we are willing to do it where it's appropriate in order to get these measures fielded and get uh, improved uh, care. So uh, challenge number three is actual measure developers. So who's developing the measures and bringing them into NQS so that they can get national application? On the Medicare side, we count more than 60 measure developers. Again, that's directly tied to the funding and directly tied to the applicability of those measures. You might be getting a grant from CMS to develop measures or a contract. You might also know that even if you are putting your own money into it, that uh, because Medicare has direct authority over that program, your measure will actually be implemented. So there's a lot of incentives to develop those measures, which makes those measure developers inherently focused on adult measurement and elder, uh, you know, sort of older adult care measurement very challenging for your population. On the Medicaid side or the pediatric side, we counted about 27 measure developers that we have ever interacted with uh, in our 20 year history. Most of them have only developed one measure. The ones that have developed more are listed here. So there's two organizations called PCPI and NCQA that are really big national measure developers and they do develop pediatric measures. Um, the CDC and AHRQ have also developed measures. ARC did actually a huge round of funding in 2015 in order to get more pediatric measures developed. And that was actually the last significant round of funding we have seen nationally. So a lot of our measures are actually three years old in this portfolio. And then you see individual children's hospitals. And so these are actually our leading children's hospitals that bring measures to us, right? Seattle, Boston, and CHOP. Um, and so you can see that even the population of high-end organizations that are trying to put these measures into utilization are much lower and their volume of development is much lower than on the adult side. Huge challenge. Finally, uh, I'll touch on very briefly low case volume. So low case volume in the Medicaid program um, is, is a real challenge. So particularly for complex or specialty care, what you see is that those services tend to be concentrated among a small set of providers. You will see a huge percentage of the complex care that's occurring in the DMV. There might be one other facility that will see the balance of cases and then everybody else um, really plummets to very low to no level. So if you are thinking about a quality improvement strategy, if you're a Medicaid agency or, or a Department of Health, uh, using the measures that we have will often only apply to a handful of facilities in your state and will not apply to anyone else. And so there is this basic methodological question around how to resolve low case volume in order to potentially have those measures apply to a wider audience, which again, from a national and public health standpoint, is really critical. So I, I won't touch on this in very much detail at all, except, that we are, except to say that we are trying to work on this issue. We're working on it through the lens of rural healthcare. So we started um, uh, sort of a, a line of rural healthcare work about two years ago. And uh, in the latest report, which you can see online, we did try to tackle this question of low case volume because it affects rural uh, counties 
um, throughout the care continuum, right, pediatric, adult, et cetera. So we are proposing several statistical methods and other methods in order to get measures to apply. This is, that's sort of more scientific than it is thematic, so I'll, I'll let you read it. Some of it is way over my head. These are true methodologists that are doing this work. But there is a potential applicability of the science so that we can improve the science and make pediatric measurement more widely applicable, applicable to your population. So let me end this section by saying, look, we've got to do better on pediatrics. I'm really here. The only reason I accepted this talk is to implore you to help. Um, you are a critically important actor. You are in D.C. We are just down the street. We are ready to partner with you. We are doing everything that we can to advocate for more funding and more development of pediatric measures. One specific action that we're going to take on October 1st is to impanel a new pediatric technical advisory committee that will be added to our endorsement infrastructure. This advisory committee will cut across all of the other committees. So as I mentioned to you, most of the other committees are seeing pediatric measures. We want to make sure that if somebody gets a pediatric measure or a committee gets a PEDS measure, this committee is available to them to um, problem solve, provide special input, make sure that the pediatric lens is being applied to it. Because a lot of the committees the outside of pediatrics don't really have enough PEDS representation. So this will hopefully help to set a strategy for how we get more measures, how we alter measures that will be then perhaps more germane to the overall PEDS population. So that's what we're working on. I'd love for your help on advocacy. I think we need better data, and I would love, absolutely love, for you all to be high-end measure developers, to bring your measures to NQF so that we can get them implemented in public programs. All right, so let me, uh, the last section I wanted to touch on is health disparities in the United States. This is really a major area of work for us. These are some really unfortunate stats that, unfortunately, I have to lead with. Um, and we, we have tried to call out um, children and, and the pediatric population in each of these. So there is, unfortunately, food insecurity, homelessness, et cetera, um, that affects, um, you know, essentially children in the United States. I, you know, saw the, I think it was the JAMA op-ed that was published just a few months ago on what it felt like as a pediatrician, and I cannot fathom this, what it feels like to discharge your patients to a shelter, what it feels like to discharge your patients to, um, you know, extremely health, uh, unequal, or disparate environment. Um, I know I've done that in the ER had to do a lot. I think it feels qualitatively different when you've got to do it all day with kids. Um, so we are going to work on this because it's just important. So these are our priorities in health equity. We have three major priorities. First, we need better data in health equity. We just don't know where these populations are. Um, we don't know what they are suffering from in terms of social risk factors or disparities. Um, so this is doing things like putting together social risk registries that could be national in scope and really identify populations of concern. Our second priority is improving quality measurement. I think we need measures specifically looking at health equity. Um, we are doing everything that we can on the measurement front, and I'll give you a couple of examples. And third, I think we can utilize best practices. So what works? Again, let's just follow the evidence. That's what we do day in and day out at NQF. What does the evidence show for how to impact uh, health care disparities? Um, and let's get the entire country to adopt them. So several examples of programs, and I'm going to do it quickly because I know we're running out of time. So first, we have a trial that's been underway at NQF for the last about three years. Um, it's three years out of five. Um, and the purpose of this trial is to really experiment with introducing social risk adjustment into measurement. So right now, you probably are all aware, measures include clinical risk adjustment. So, you know, if there's a lot of comorbidities, if there's reasons to believe that a person will, will have a worse clinical outcome merely because of their clinical risk factors, it is now common practice in uh, measurement to include clinical risk adjustment in the, uh, in the risk model. Our question is, should we be including social risk in the risk model? What would be the approach for doing that, and what would be the potential impact? So what we have done in order to implement this trial is we've asked every measure developer that's interacting with us, that's bringing a measure into endorsement, if they have an outcome measure that has a risk model, if the risk model conceptually would support the inclusion of social risk factors, then we ask them to gather the relevant data to do the risk adjustment and see if there's any impact on performance. Um, and if there is, we are willing as an organization to endorse the measure with the social risk factor built into the risk model. And one of the reasons for this is to make sure that we are leveling the playing field for providers in the same way that we have done previously for clinical risk factors. And so at this point, after two plus years, we have endorsed 10 measures um, with so with some kind of social risk factor built in. And the biggest impediment to doing that is access to data. It's access to that, the, 
the data that indicates whether or not there is a social risk present or not present in this population. Um, on, the, on the measurement front, we are taking head on uh, the issue of food insecurity. So we did a project a couple of years ago which really identified food insecurity as an area where there is a growing evidence base that it works or that addressing it works and that it has clear outcomes on uh, health and health care. Uh, and so we are working with Humana. Um, they are the primary measure developer to create three in, uh, food insecurity measures that will help them identify their beneficiaries that are at risk for food insecurity and help them to create programs around those beneficiaries. So one note I'll just make is because of our role as an endorser, we do not develop measures, but we can help you develop measures, right? So we can put you in touch with the right stakeholders. We can bring our measurement expertise to the table and make sure that if you are engaging, particularly in novel measure development that's going to fill a priority gap, that we are helping you on that journey so it's as efficient a process as it can be. So Humana is funding and executing the measure development, uh, and we are providing them technical assistance so that uh, they can get through it. Data. So I mentioned to you one of the basic uh, issues in risk adjustment for social risk factors is lack of data. So we launched a project this year that is now concluded uh, focused on data integration. So we brought together 40 plus of our member organizations and really asked where is social risk data sitting today, even if it's outside of healthcare? How do we get that data to combine with each other? What are, you know, uh, what are approaches that we can use to actually create uh, sort of an, an all social risk factor database, at least given what we have today? And then how do we set a path for identifying that kind of data going forward? How do we collect that data primarily? So basic questions here are who should collect that data? Should it be a payer at the time of enrollment? Should, be a, should it be a delivery system at the time of a clinical interaction? Um, how big should that data set be, et cetera? So um, there are recommendations available for that uh, action team, and we are actively working on a next phase of work in order to get those recommendations implemented. Uh, next, we did a project actually for the Medicaid program looking at food insecurity and housing instability. And we actually, again, this was done in combination with the Urban Institute, uh, where we made recommendations to CMS, sort of Medicaid writ large, how their programs could be changed in order to affect these two areas. And, and again, I, I view both food and housing as uh, fundamentally important areas. And you've seen big delivery systems like Kaiser, like Geisinger, make massive resource uh, investment in these spaces. So this was work done specifically at the behest of Medicaid. And finally, I just want to touch on uh, payment. So having worked at CMS, the largest insurer in the world, payment matters. We spend a lot of money on healthcare. I think we could use some of that money for uh, the community. Uh, and so what we did earlier this summer is we convened a major payment summit on the social determinants of health really asking how do we utilize payment, what are the models that work in order to effectuate change uh, in SDOH. And that, those resources, that payment could go to delivery systems, it could also go to communities. So this was actually a really interesting and fun event. We convened a lot of national payers, Aetna, United, Humana. We, we convened big health systems. And importantly, we convened community-based organizations that we have really never worked with before. Um, and so those recommendations are pending. We're going to put them out in uh, October. We're going to conduct a Hill briefing. Uh, you know, because of our history uh, working with the Hill and, and just the, what the roots of NQF are, we often have a lot of dialogue with the Hill. So we'll be doing a specific briefing to focus on those recommendations and how to get the Hill to legislate on them. And then we're actively talking with the various organizations that participated, again, about a new phase of work, um, which I'm really excited about, that I hope will serve as a national paradigm for how to effectuate change in these areas. So again, it comes down to better data, best evidence, more money but I think we can definitely have an impact on healthcare disparities. All right, so that's me. That's how you contact me. I urge you to call, email anytime. Do not follow me on Twitter. Nothing good going on there. Uh, and I, do, I want to show you, so, so Kavita was very uh, clear to me. She said, every pediatrics talk has a, has a picture of your kid. I was like, I did not know that. Thank you for that cultural input. So here are the, here's the picture of my kids. This is at the CNMC uh, run that, we, that you guys have every year. I called this out because this was, I think, two years ago, and it just rained like crazy during this thing. I don't know if you uh, ran this. Uh, so this is a picture of both of our girls, and then this is me crossing the finish line with our nine-year-old. And what she was saying at that moment was, Daddy, my clothes are so heavy, because uh, they were just saturated with water. But we really enjoy that event every year. So thank you again, and I'm happy to take questions if you have them. Oh, yeah.
Thanks very much. Uh, I was wondering what the role of um, uh, EMRs uh, together with web services might be in answering some of these questions. We're a Cerner shop, and Cerner has gotten together with AWS, uh, Amazon Web Services, uh, to look at creating uh, data lakes that would include all of the data from the children's hospitals that they have. I suspect Epic is doing the same thing. Would that be one way of trying to answer the question that you were speaking of earlier? Yeah, thank you. That's a great question. So I, I absolutely do think it would be. Um, we, uh, I, I don't think we as, as a society have had much uh, success so far with sort of EHR-based measures. Um, we do have an ECQM program. So if you bring an EHR-based measure to us, we will review it on almost a separate cycle because there's such a priority on those measures. There's a lot of potential for them to be much less burdensome for collection, to be part of the clinical workflow. So I very much agree with that whole approach. I think it needs to bear a little bit more fruit. So after three years of working with uh, vendors and others, we only have a handful of e-measures, but that is clearly where the field needs to go. I mean, without it, we'll be reliant on registries and claims for a long time, and there are clear limitations of those uh, data sets. Now, thank you for the question.